All right. In today's uh, lesson, we are going to talk about, um, remember, we've been talking about the exile. And uh, so just to kind of recap here, okay, um, the Bible started with Genesis, and it showed God's sovereignty, but then it showed the fall of all mankind. Everyone was evil. Then it showed God saving or draw, calling one family to minister to the whole. Okay, it started with the promise, then it went to a covenant, and then it became the law. Okay, now um, with uh, with that, the 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 patriarchs grew and expanded, and they were blessed wherever they went. Then they went to uh, Egypt uh, to um, to to escape a famine. Uh, to escape a famine. Um, and then 400 years later, about, um, they, they had been slavery and all this, and uh, Moses rose up and led them out. Now, they went, they, they left and went somewhere probably in the Sinai Peninsula um, to Mount Sinai, um, and then they went up uh, to Canaan, but after, after a bad report from some spies that they sent in, they, they got um, kind of scared, and so they went out into the desert for 40 years. Um, and uh, then at the end of the 40 years, they, they went back to the land to conquer it, and uh, Moses writes the five, the five first books of your Bible, and then the events of Joshua happen, and Moses dies, and Joshua leads them in. Um, and then the time of the Judges, which come, goes to, leads us to about 1050 or so, B.C., 1050 B.C., um, and then the book, uh, the, the events of First and Second Sam, Samuel happen, which starts the kingdom, and the kingdom is is going under under one king until about um, when was it nine nine thirty or so if I remember correctly, um, and it was split under King Solomon's son Rehoboam, and uh, then um, they had been existed as two separate uh, kingdoms, uh, Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And um, then throughout the course of time, Israel falls to Syria in 722, and the, and the people group that become the Samaritans are moved in. And in Judah, um, it falls um, over 100 years later in 586. But if you remember, I said that the first, um, they, they just became a vassal state in 605. The second um, attack was in 597, and then the last one was in 586, and that's when Judah, uh, Judah was destroyed. Um, now, when Judah was destroyed, a small amount of Israelites were allowed to stay um, just to kind of till the land and everything, but the majority of everybody was pulled out. Uh, but in 605, it seems like um, they only took the intelligent, the, the really intelligent, intelligent ones and the, and the healthy ones and, and the youth and that kind of idea. Um, I, I haven't really researched that aspect that much, but that seems to be the consensus. Um, so we can safely assume that, that, that Daniel is... is um, was at least thought of it as a smarter individual. Um, so, okay, that takes us to, to the prophet of Daniel. And um, so this is, the, the, his prophecies really begin kind of at, at, at the beginning of his, you know, um, time in, 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 in Babylon. Um, so uh, he prophesies from about 605 to about 530, somewhere in there. If you look, that's like 70 years. That's uh, that's a really long time <laughs> to be a prophet. Um, and, you know, he he, kind of, he rose in, 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 in King Nebuchadnezzar's court and whatnot, and he kind of seemed like he was staying at least well-known for um, a number of years since he was able to, to talk to Belsh Belshazzar about the uh, writing on the wall. Um, so... Um, he he lived through the two the, the Babylon and all the way through till Persia. I mean that's a pretty good deal there. Um, the book of Daniel is, is very it, there's a lot to go go through with Daniel with it being such a short book. It's only got 12 chapters and yet it's got a lot of of, of depth. First off, it's apocalyptic literature. Now. Apocalyptic is prophetic, yes. However, apocalyptic is a whole nother ball field. I mean, they, they talk about things a lot, a lot differently. There's different themes. Um, and when you compare it to prophetic literature, it seems, 
it revolves obviously apocalypse around the end, you know, and, and so it, it carries kind of a different tone to it. Things tend to be a little more mystical in apocalyptic literature, whereas in prophecy they'll say things still they'll still say it poetic, but they'll say it not so clear in apocalypse. So it is apocalyptic literature, and it is different. We need to understand that it is a historical book, in that you know, but there it is also um, apocalyptic. So whereas the 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 focus of a lot of the other prophetic books is more of of history from their time on like a couple hundred years, Daniel, I mean, hops around time wise thousands of years. I mean, just hops around, uh, really hops around a lot. Um, so with Apocalypse, you got You have to be careful because not everything in Apocalypse do we know. You know, and some people will come by and say, oh, this is that and this is that. But sometimes they could be right and sometimes they could be wrong. Um, I'll give you an example. Different people who go through Revelations and say, you know, this is what this means. I've worked out this, this, this timeline and, well, maybe some aspects of their timeline is correct, but overall I would avoid such pointless controversy. Um, it's kind of a waste of your time, and it, when, when people compose these little end times timelines, they, they completely miss the point of what the text is saying, why it was written, just so that they can you know have a clear understanding about the end. So uh, to me, I would rather have truth and, and facts too than, than bias. So uh, but then also it's biblical. If you look at other apocalyptic writings, um, especially from from the Jewish people, it carries these different tones to it. You know, kind of kind of darker. Um, most of the time, there's no hope, and and just kind of a just kind of a a feel to it that doesn't mesh with the rest of Scripture. Um, but but in Daniel, we see some we see something unique. It's apocalyptic, yes, but it it has this. This hopeful feel to it, and it's almost like everything's not for waste. There, there's a there's a grand purpose that we're talking about here, and it, it's very interesting to note that. Um, and it, if I had to compare Daniel to anything, Daniel is the Old Testament's version of the New Testament's book Revelation. I would compare it like that. Um, Revelations is oftentimes misunderstood, oftentimes misused, in the same way Daniel is oftentimes misunderstood and misused. So, but then also it's global. It doesn't just involve Israel. It doesn't just involve Israel and her immediate neighbors. It involves all time. It involves all people, and and just that that God has this this hold and He's in control. Now, um, it is important to note that it, that it is we do consider it as unique revelation. It is part of the Bible. Some people will say, oh well, it was written after the fact. For the writings that are written after the fact, it has a whole different. They write it differently. And this, you can tell, was not written after the fact, just by the way and the style it was written. Um, but even if it was, if you hold to the inerrancy of Scripture, you really can't affirm this view either, because once again, it, it, it says that pretty much this was not a revelation from the Lord, even though it claims to be. In other words, the text is lying um, and, and, will, and trying to deceive its audience. You know, um, so, But as far as if you're not a Christian, uh, there is substantial um, um, evidence uh, proof, I guess you'd say, um, that it was not written after the fact. Um, if you will do an impartial um, study, there is there is evidence that could go to the other way too. But for the impartial observer, they'll they'll see that 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 you know there there is at least room for adequate um, pause, I guess, for adequate uh, reconsideration. We need to consider the Book of Daniel. Um, at least we should consider to consider the Book of Daniel as um, unique revelation that was that was revealed before the fact, um, and that that it is very very um, unique. It's not quite like those other books. So, um, but also we need to say it's historic apocalyptic. Um, some of the things in Daniel have already happened. Some of the things will happen, and then some of the events recorded historically. People have tried to contradict. I'll give you a few examples. Um, well, actually, I'll just give you the one. I'll give you one example for now. Um, in the book of Daniel, somewhere near the middle, um, there's there's a king named Belshazzar, and he's throwing this feast. And during the course of this, he uses the the, the items from it, from the from the Lord's te uh, temple, 
and the, the writing comes down and writes on the wall, and Daniel comes in and interprets what what that means. Now, a lot of people have said this is not his, and this didn't actually happen because a, um, well, this has been resolved in recent years, but originally they said a Belshazzar, um, it, it was not a king of of Babylon, um, you know, and, and they stuck with that for a long time. Well, lo and behold. Um, it turned out that Belshazzar indeed wasn't the king. He was one of the kings. You see, the real king, I believe his name was Nabonidus, um, started worshipping this one god exclusively. I think it was the moon god. And so he goes out to the desert and um, leaves his son, Belshazzar, as co-regent. But for the people in Babylon, they knew Belshazzar as the king. So once again, you know, people have hopped immediately to saying, oh, there's error when it could have been explained if they would just hold on for a second. Um, but then also, if you go on down the story, it says that Belshazzar is Babylon's son. I'm sorry, Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's son. And then people say, well, he's he's not his son. Well, yes, but we already talked about this. The term that translates to son doesn't necessarily mean direct descendant. It can mean you know descended by a span of time. And sometimes it even seems to imply that they're not even necessarily related, but that they have the same position. Um, try that one on for size. Um, but um, with that being said, uh, uh, Belshazzar and Neb Nebuchadnezzar were related, just by extension. Um, so anyways, um, those are just two of the examples that, that people have tried to say, okay, it was not historic. Remember, the book of Daniel was written by someone who was actually there. We are separated by thousands of years trying to understand something that we only understand a fragment of it. We'll never know what it was like to live in Babylon at this time. Yet we are we are very quick to judge the content, saying, nope, it is it cannot be true, um, really with no adequate reason for, for putting such disbelief on it. Um, and, and so, so yes, uh, we do need to see it as, as historic apocalyptic. So uh, one thing, a very interesting thing that happens within the book itself is the Son of Man and the Ancient of Days. Now, it's very... Very neat how this works. Um, you see, he's talking about a prophecy about um, the word, how he will one day um, come, and after he has come, he will um, be lifted up to the to the to the uh, up in heaven. And that's where it picks up in seven thirteen through fourteen. Um, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. Once again, talking about that second coming of the Lord. Um, and it seems like possibly the first coming as well. It's it's a little bit vague. Once again, um, people oftentimes thought that it was going to be one coming. They didn't understand there was going to be two. So as a result, um, a lot of times the way things are worded could mean could point to either or both. So, um, kind of un, un, unimportant whether he's talking about the first or the second coming, just as you understand the, the idea that he's talking about here. Now, the Son of Man is obviously um, who we would later know as Jesus, and the Ancient of Days is who we would later know as as, as the Father, but it's Yahweh, Yahweh God. Um, so, as far as... Um, as far as, as the title, Son of Man, that Jesus uses, a lot of times people think that that he's using it to, to refer to himself as a, in a humble tone, but that's very unlikely. It seems most likely that he's talking about himself as the Son of Man that was mentioned in Daniel, uh, pointing to his power and his glory. Um, so some themes from Daniel, which you'll notice are also themes of the book of Revelation. First off, God's sovereignty, that God is in control, that even in one part of it, Daniel says, and I was really afraid because of these visions that I saw, but yet God is still in control, and he's saying way ahead of time, David, Daniel, this is what's going to happen. And, and it's just very interesting. So God's sovereignty, and we see the same thing happen in Revelations, that God is saying, you know, this is what's going to happen, but I, I've got it under control. But then also a key theme that we see, and we'll show, I'll show you this with the outline of the book of Daniel, um, is man's pride. One of the key factors of Daniel is the fact that, that, that people are so prideful against the Lord, and they think that they have power, they think that they have strength, um, and it's just all for naught in the light of God's you know, knowledge. I mean, even if it was, God wasn't all-powerful, 
he he sees this is going to happen. So, I mean, if he had foreknowledge, and then he would find some way to outwit them if he wasn't powerful enough, which we know he is powerful enough because he's God. So, um, then a third theme is the victory of God's saints. Now, all three of these are the same for Daniel and Revelation. Revelation and Daniel, just they, they, go, they go together. Um, and so, the victory of God's saints. A good, uh, a good theme to have, I would say. So here's a, here's an outline of, of Daniel. Um, if you look here, um, remember with chiasm that the thing in the in the middle is usually the most important thing that you need to understand. So it starts and ends. Now remember there are 12 chapters, so the chiasm only extends to the first eight chapters. It starts and ends the preparation of Daniel and others, and then the vision of the kingdoms. So those don't really, you know, seems like they're they're two different things, but that's because the vision of the kingdoms is used to go into another um, discourse, I guess you say. Um, chapter two is Nebuchadnezzar's dream, whereas chapter seven is the vision of the four beasts. Chapter three is the fiery furnace, whereas chapter six is the lion's den. So you have two situations of persecution. Nebuchadnezzar's dream is in chapter four, and writing on the walls on chapter five. So you have these two things, Nebuchadnezzar's dream being the part where he, he's uh, made like an animal and he, and he you know, uh, is driven insane, once again, man's pride, and writing on the wall, where Belshazzar's pride loses the kingdom. So you see the, 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 the um, man's pride as, as the middle there, then you see um, the, um, what did I say, the, the victory of God's saints, then you see the the God sovereignty and the vision of the four beasts and Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the preparation of Daniel. You see you see God's sovereignty there and the vision of the kingdoms. You see God's uh, God's sovereignty there. So just a real, real nice outline there. Um, excuse me. And so that takes us to chapter nine, which is Daniel's prayer and vision. Ten through eleven is message of encouragement, and then the last chapter is the troubles and victory. Um, it's you know if you if you read through there through Daniel I'm sure you'll see um, how the out or if you read through the Bible I'm sure you'll see how my outlines or how the outlines I didn't write these outlines um, one of them I think I did but the other ones I, I just modified or, or stuck exactly the same as the book um, but you'll be able to see how how that fits in so I already talked about Belshazzar as the co-regent another issue that people have is with Darius the Mede says in 531, um, so Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. And then it says in 628, so this Daniel enjoyed success in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So now it's kind of kind of weird and different translations read a little bit differently. Some say um, Cyrus and, um, and, and uh, uh, Darius and in Cyrus's reign, but others say Cyrus, who is Darius, um, I'm sorry, Darius, who is Cyrus. I'm getting all mixed up. Um, so there's been a lot of questions as to who Cyrus is. Some people, I'm, Darius, Darius. There's been a lot of speculation as who Darius is. Now, um, Darius is either the same person as Cyrus, uh, person as Cyrus the Persian. <laughs> I'm just not having a good time today. Or um, it, he could be Guberu, who was the governor. Uh, or he could be um, simply who he is, Darius, uh, who, is, who would be maybe um, Cyrus's conqueror, the person who he sent out to actually conquer the city. Uh, it's interesting to note that if, if my studies, if I remember my studies correctly, Babylon was pretty much won overnight in the sense that the city just opened itself up because, once again, Nabonidus was worshipping this, this moon god out in the desert. And the Babylonians were, were upset because... You know the Bab the people, the the kings had had taken the other gods from the other places, and had um, you know then Nabonidus was just worshiping this one god, so they started getting really concerned. So it seems likely that um, that uh, if I remember correctly, I, once again I'm a, I'm real real hazy on 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 history after you know 600 um, BC. Um, if I remember correctly, though, uh, Babylon just pretty much opened the doors uh, to the conqueror, um, whoever that was, whether it was Darius or under Cyrus or whether it was Cyrus. It's you know, but once again, these things can be explained, especially with more time and study. We we can we can find more things out. You know, we don't have to instantly write something off. And so so often we're we're so quick to quick to to uh, 
try to disprove the Bible, and it's like, well, if you just hold on, remember, it is a historical book. Um, regardless of your views of it as scripture, it is still a historical book, and we need to, you know, seriously consider the things that it claims. Um, so also, uh, it's interesting that when Cyrus came, uh, he used this as an opportunity um, to return the let the let the people return to their land, let, let the let the gods go back to their lands, um, and, and he used that as as a way to solidify his, his reign. And we'll talk about that um, later when we get to the post-exile. But that takes us to the Book of Lamentations, which was written either right at the fall of Judah or it was written somewhat quickly afterwards. Um, you can tell because it. it it was very much so, as you can see there, firsthand. He describes things that are that are brutal, and he describes things, you know, in, in just the, the tone of the weeping of it. This wasn't something that he overheard. This was something that he experienced. So it, traditionally, it, people have said that it was written by Jeremiah, but once again, the writer of the book itself um, never really points. I mean, for all we know, we could it could be written by a series of people. You know, we, we really don't know that. But tradition says Jeremiah. So, um, uh, in, in Lamentations, the key theme is brought up that, that Israel, who is God's chosen, now has no land. You know, uh, just this, this weeping about it. And the fact that, that, that in chapter 5 they say, you know, our only hope is in the one who removed our home. So God, basically they say this, you know, we messed up, and, and God is the one who has us. God's the one who caused us. God's the one who's still in control, and God's the one who gives us hope that, that we may one day return. Um, it does strongly use uh, poetry, what's called acrostics. Acrostics. Now basically what that means is every uh, line or, or paragraph or whatever starts with um, the next letter of the alphabet. So, you know, line one would start with A if it was in English, line two would start with B, line, line three C. And so, uh, um, in, in in chapter one you see that, and through, in some other places in Lamentations, but in Hebrew it doesn't you won't see it in your translation because once again English, but in the in the Hebrew uh, translation you will see it, um, um, the way that it'll say, um, oh my, it's hard to elaborate about this, but you know, chapter verse one will will start with the aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew. Then then verse two will start with the beth, and then verse three will start with the geth, and, and you can just, you can kind of understand where I'm going from, going from. Hopefully, if you don't understand what an acrostic is, even after the lesson from earlier, um, Psalm 119 uh, is an acrostic that actually translates which. Um, which Hebrew letter goes with it. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention with Daniel um, is that Daniel is one of the one of the books that has um, Aramaic in it. In fact, um, it's really the biggest section that's in Aramaic that um, causes it to be doubted sometimes. Um, so we just wanted to make that known to you. Um, the, 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 the majority of the time when people say um, some of the Old Testament is written in Aramaic, they're mostly usually talking about Daniel. Um, and not the whole thing was written in Aramaic, just parts of it, which is why some people thought that later translations, or, or I'm sorry, there were later editions after the fact. So uh, a very simple uh, outline for Lamentations is uh, Jer Jerusalem's Lament in chapter 1, the angry God in chapter 2, or their angry God in chapter 2, Judah's Lament in chapter 3, Judah's utter ruin in chapter 4, and Judah's plea in chapter 5. I mean, really just simple. I mean, it, it could be, like like I say, it could be a composition of multiple um, poems. But uh, very simple outline. Uh, so that takes us to the prophet Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel um, was taken probably in the second wave in 597. But he prophesied from about 593 or so to about 570. And this was obviously during the reign of Babylon. Um, so, um, his audience was Judah and the exiles. Um, so, it, it, Judah in the sense of, of sending stuff back to the people who were still in Israel before 586, and um, Judah in the sense, I mean, sorry, and the exiles in the sense of those people who were, he was living with. Um, so, he was a priest. Um, that, that's, that's one of the things that's mentioned in chapter 1. 
um, probably exiled 597, I already mentioned that. Uh, his wife died, and he wasn't allowed to grieve for her as a sign uh, to the people. Now, once again, talking about prophets, you know, uh, there's a lot of people today in, in Pentecostal and charismatic churches that try to will themselves to be prophets. Th they want very badly to have that word to say, and you know, they always have a really nasty attitude, and yet they have these prophecies to give, and it's like, okay, whereas that's possible, one, it's not likely. I mean, usually from the outpour of your heart is what comes through the mouth. Um, and, and so, you know, chances are that, that that kind of stuff is not really not really prophecy. Um, we need to be extremely careful because when you claim to be, to be a prophet, basically what you're saying is, I am God's mouthpiece. And so you, you, need, to, you need to be careful about that. Um, he did prophesy to a blind people who would not listen. Um... Ezekiel uh, 3.11 says this, but his name means God has strengthened. Once again, El is, means God. It's a general term for, for God. Um, and the same as, as some other terms are general terms for God. Um, and so like when, when we say like El Elohim, it's, it's not really God's name, you know. Um, so in, if, with that being said, I'll, I'll touch on this in the discipleship class, but... Um, I mean, well, no, I'll touch on that in the disciples' discipleship class. Um, and Ezekiel 3.11. Go to the exiles, to the sons of your people, and speak to them and tell them whether they listen or not. Thus says the Lord God. And a lot of times they didn't listen. Um, so... Let's go ahead and move on to the outline. I think that's all I wanted to mention about the introduction. So... The oracles and events of Ezekiel's calling in chapter 1 through 5. Now, it mentions Tel Abib. That's a heap of ruins. It's, um, if I remember correctly, right outside the city of Babylon that was there. That's mentioned in 315. Um, it also mentions the day of the Lord in chapter 6 through 7. So you see judgment on uh, the day of the Lord involves judgment of God's God against the sin. You see the cleansing of God's people, which, you know, I, I know a lot of times Christians, oh, we want to be cleansed and all that stuff. And they don't really understand that that involves a lot of sacrifice, a lot of hurt, a lot of forgiveness, and a lot of love. It's very difficult to be cleansed. So once again, I'm not saying Christians shouldn't seek to be cleansed. I'm just saying for some reason we have this idea in the church that cleansing it, it involves, you know, feeling really good and, and you know, hey, everything's fine and hunky-dory. And it's just not, that's not what the cleansing of the Lord is. Because if you look seriously, you'll see that the church has been corrupted, especially in America. Um I think the lack of persecution, to some extent, has made us a little soft. Um, I know we, we've got so, gotten so used to our rights as Americans that we've forgotten about what we, we need to sacrifice as Christians. Oh, I have a right to do this. I have a right to free speech. Yeah, you do as an American, but as a Christian, you should probably keep your mouth shut if you don't have anything nice to say. So... Um, but then also, the day of the Lord involves the salvation of God's people. Um, in chapter 8 through 11, a very strong contrast. Remember how I said um, a, a theme throughout the before the exile and in the beginning of the exile is the holy means and things, the holy things made profane. Uh, the exact same thing happens in chapters 8 through 11 of Ezekiel. The glory of the Lord departs. Now, if you remember, Ezekiel ended with the glory of the Lord coming on the tabernacle, um, and and now um, and now it's departing. So you just see this clear contrast. Um, so it mentions Tammuz. This is the wife of Ishtar. I'll, I'll turn there in 8, 14 through 15. Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. He said to me, Do you see this, son of man? Yet you will see still greater abominations than these. So um, Tammuz is the wife of Ishtar, who's another god. Um, yeah, I think uh, maybe you've heard of Ishtar's Gate. Um, but anyways, <clears throat> um, so while these things are happening, you know, the gate of the Lord's house, they're weeping for this for this other God, even, even while the destruction of the Lord is coming. You know, oftentimes when, when, when we receive God's judgment, it's because we have closed a door and opened up walls around us that God can't speak to us. You know, we, we've 
isolated ourselves from God's voice by, by choosing to fall in love with the things that he's told us not to. He has clearly spoken to us. And then, um, you know, we, we ju judgment comes on us and we say, hey, how, why is this a thing? Well, so, <clears throat> even while this stuff is happening, still Tammuz is being weeped for. So, uh, about the term the Son of Man, um, it can refer to, generally speaking, a, a human being. But um, for the for the context, obviously, there are some things that are alluding to Jesus as the Son of Man, and there are some things that are saying clearly about Jesus. Um, so fatalism is rebuked. You know, they had this idea. There's a few of them. First off, some of them had this idea: we're Israelites. You know, hey, God's nothing's going. God's not going to let anything happen to us. But then others had this idea that it doesn't matter what we do; um, it's going to it's going to fall apart, and, and and there's nothing we can do to change it. Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the East Gate. I'll plot down for some more. Um, he said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give evil advice in the city, who say, The time is not near to build houses. This is the, is the pot, and we are the flesh. Therefore prophesy against them, Son of man, prophesy. Then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and he said to me, Say, Thus says the Lord, so you think, House of Israel, for I know your thoughts. You have multiplied your slain in this city, filling its streets with them. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the Lord God, your slain, whom you have laid in the midst of the city, are the flesh, and this city is the pot, but I will bring you out of it. You have feared a sword, so I will bring a sword upon you. So just a lot of different uh, ideas of, of, of that the, they were unable to change what was going to happen or what they thought was going to happen, and both of those views are wrong. Um, fatalism in any of its forms is usually wrong. It's based on, you know, um, hopelessness or uh, pride. Once again, the fatalism that, oh no, God's not going to bring any um, any judgment. We're going to always live here. You know, that would be an example of fatalism that um, that is not based on, on depression, but on pride. So the Mount of Olives is east of Jor Jerusalem. It's mentioned there in 11, 22 through 25. Talks about that uh, judgment against Jerusalem in chapters 12 through 24. Now, Judah is extremely wicked. Uh, it says that in 14, 12. And they're, they're compared to an unfaithful wife. Now, there are two images that people have ran crazy with. The first one is the two eagles. Uh, some people who are American obviously think that it has something to do with America because, once again, um, somehow somebody who prophesied thousands of years ago about two eagles must have known that America was going to use the eagle as its symbol. Well, you know, that's just about the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um it, in fact, it even clarifies itself within the prophecy itself. The two eagles are Babylon and Egypt. Prophecy solved. You know, I mean, goodness sakes. Uh, don't believe everything you hear just because somebody on TV says it. Um, the two vines that are mentioned in, in, in um, um, I, I don't know where it's mentioned, but somewhere <laughs> in, in uh, between 12 and 24 of, uh, of Ezekiel, why didn't I write that one down as a question? Um, but um, it talks about Ezekiel, I'm sorry, ex exiles and Zedekiah. Jeremiah 38, 17 through 23 uh, references this as well, and I'll turn there. Um, then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus is Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will indeed go out to the officers of the king of Babylon, then you will live. The city will not be burned with fire, and you and your household will survive. Um, it goes on like that, but you can look that up for yourself there. But the two vines are the exiles and, and uh, um, Zedekiah. So, in chapter 18, 1 through 4, what do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers eat sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins will die. Um, and uh, so the sin was blamed on the parents. You know, oh, we're we're not at fault. It's it's our parents' fault. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the Lord God, rather that, than that he should turn from his ways and live. Turn from his ways and live. So they were saying, oh, we aren't to blame for this. We aren't to, just like people do today. Well, my parents did this. Let's say your parents were the worst people in the world. I mean, goodness sakes, move on. It's time to grow and allow your spirit to be free of that 
bitterness. So um, it, it mentions a lioness and, and cubs. The lioness is Judah. The cubs is, are, are Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. It's mentioned in 19, 1 through 2. Um, in 22, 3, and 18, it mentions the bloodshed in the city. Um, that's injustice. And it mentions dross. What dross is is it's the refuse material left from molten metal. If you've ever done any kind of metal working, the dross is, is the is the waste that comes off. That It has no purpose. You just kind of... You, you throw it away after you purify it. So uh, it mentions the two sisters, Ahola and Aholiba, in 23, in chapter 23, uh, verses 1 through 4. Ahola means my tent, and Aholiba, it means my tent is in her. Um, so then that takes us to the oracles against the nations in chapter 25 all the way through 32. Um, we already talked about Tyre and Sidon there on the port, very rich part of Phoenicia. Um, and here's a a good uh, map that I pulled off the internet. You know, Israel's down here. The Golan Heights are over here. And you see Tyre and Sidon. Um, so here's the Mediterranean Sea. And Syria's over here. Um, so it says here, anti-Lebanon. The, remember, the Lebanon mountains and everything there, that's right here. Where, where it says that they got all that wood from, Lebanon, the force of Lebanon. Um, so... Uh, that takes us to the uh, Israel's restorations. Restoration mentioned from chapter 33 to 39. Um, remember, this is still at the at the beginning of, of this the, this time in exile. Um, so it, it it talks about the shepherd and the flock and the bad shepherds and that stuff. Very clearly alluding to Jesus as the good shepherd that would one day come. It talks about the dry bones, the, the way that the people are dead, but that they would be restored to life. It talks about Gog and Magog. Now, about the dry bones, uh, I know people have kind of misunderstood this. In its context, what it's talking about is the way that the people of Israel were, 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 were dead inside spiritually, but then also there were a lot of them who were dead physically in the land. So then uh, Ezekiel gets this prophecy about these dead bones coming to life which obviously was talking about the restoration of Israel, but then also in a broader sense, he was also talking about restoration of all people in, uh, in the, the work that Jesus would do, which would be followed up by the giving of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, Gog and Magog are mentioned. This is the ultimate foe of God's people. Um, once again, I wouldn't try wasting your time on... Comparing it, I mean, saying that it's a certain person that you see, oh, it's ISIS, or oh, it's this, or, or, or this, or that, or uh, just hold off on that. You'll know what it is when it happens. After it's all said and done, you'll know. But for the, for the meantime, you know, don't miss the message because you're trying so hard to understand the setting of the message, if that makes sense. I know historically you have to know what's going on, but then also sometimes we try to interpret the Bible according to what we see now rather than what was meant then. That makes sense. Um, so, um, Israel's new temple is mentioned in, in, in there in chapter 40 through 48. And basically, going back to the prophecy thing, lean on the on the side of, of caution. Okay, with, with any model or anything that you see or hear or, or conjure up yourself, lean on the side of, of caution. Um, Israel's new temple is mentioned in chapter 40 through 48. The 12 gates for the 12 tribes. Um, and the name is Lord is there. Um, so, uh, anyways, uh, Ezekiel does mention that, that, that those who lied would suffer first. The, the false prophets, the, the, the bad shepherds, they would all be the first to suffer. So, that takes us to the book of First and Second Kings, which is where we are going to stop. Um, this lesson has been long enough, and um, I wanted to cover a lot of different things and do that br very brief review summary there. Um, so uh, that's where we're going to stop. Uh, next time we'll talk about First and Second Kings. We will talk about Psalms, and uh, that will take us out of the books written um, during the uh, during the exile. Everything else will be written after the exile. So if you notice, we've only got a few books left in the Old Testament. Very exciting. Um, we'll see you next time.